Hey friends, welcome to this episode of Good Take, Bad Take. This, of course, is the podcast where we go through our social media feeds to find takes that we like, takes that we think are a little bit silly, and we like to highlight them both and uh, talk about why the take is good or bad, as it may be. My name is Donald, and I'm here with my co-host, Britt. Before we get started, just a reminder to like and share and comment, all that good stuff. Engage with us, follow us on our socials, which if you're watching our video version on YouTube are right up on the screen. Uh, if not, you can find us at Good Take Bad Take Pod on Instagram, Good Take, or excuse me, Good Bad Take Pod on Twitter and YouTube. Uh, but without further ado, we'll move on to the first take. And this one is a post from Ian Bremmer, who I, I don't know exactly who he is. I've, I've seen the name floating around, so he's, he's familiar to me. I, he might be a journalist of some kind or yeah. something like that. And he posts this picture from, uh, I think it was like a Bloom, I don't know if a Bloomberg article posted this particular graphic, but I think the data was taken from Bloomberg. And uh, it shows a side-by-side -side comparison of streaming services and their costs versus cable. And so it shows streaming, $89. And the breakdown would be Discovery Plus is $5, Apple TV Plus $5, Amazon Prime Video $9, Peacock $10, Paramount Plus $10. HBO Max 15, Netflix 15, Disney Plus 20. And then it shows cable, uh, all one bar, of course, because you get all the channels wrapped in with this cable package, $79. And the post accompanying it is, and we've done a full 360. So comparing this, showing that streaming is now uh, allegedly more expensive than cable, what do you, what do you think, Britt? Are, uh, are you a cable user or are you a streaming server uh, service user? Uh, enjoyer well i i don't really know the tone that ian bremer is is meaning to say this with like i think he is somewhat right in in that like we've done a 360 but he's also very wrong and so i think it's a bad take um yeah that's i remember where i was going i remember my parents uh we didn't have cable growing up uh we just had all the public channels and things that you know the the, the standard ones that came that you could get through an antenna and one of the reasons why my parents said it was like, oh, yeah, like we're going to pay. I think it was like 40 bucks or something like that back when I was growing up. Like you're paying 40 bucks to get because I really wanted Cartoon Network. I love Scooby-Doo and I want to watch it. I was in the same same camp. <laughs> and they're like, well, we're not going to pay $40 just for you to watch Scooby-Doo uh, when you have all these other, you know, all, all these other things out there. Like that's what you're paying for. You're, if you pay $40 is to get all the channels, uh, but you're only paying for it as a kid to watch Scooby-Doo. And uh, that's why I think is so awesome and amazing about the the uh, the streaming services is, I mean, I don't, I basically all of these I don't have except for Disney Plus. Um, right. I have that because I got the bundle with uh, Hulu, ESPN because I love UFC, and then uh, Disney Plus because I want to watch all the Star Wars shows every now and then. But everything else, I either have a friend's login. I guess I have Prime, but Prime is for the benefits that come with shipping from Amazon. So. You know, I, I, I do not pay $89 a month for subscription streaming services, but I can dial it in to exactly what I want, right? Like the market has provided that, which is really, really amazing and good, uh, which is way more efficient than cable. If, you know, I was a kid and I could pay $5.99 a month for uh, $5.99 a month for Scooby-Doo, I mean, that's way more affordable for a kid than $40 a month for uh, for cable for a bunch of content you don't need. And uh, that's what's amazing about the streaming services is, you can customize, pick and choose, dial it in, and get unlimited whenever you want on demand. It's just, it's great. That, yeah. So I, the one thing I, I have to wonder, because I haven't seen the actual data breakdown, is where they're getting $79 for cable, because that seems kind of cheap depending on the package. But there are a lot of bundles you can do. And I, the only time I have ever, quote unquote, paid for cable was about five years ago, maybe, I was in charge of uh, the house. I, a bunch of us rented a house together and I was, I was in charge of the internet plan and they were like, mm. Hey, uh, we'll lower your internet rate for a yes. year if you take this cable. And then the idea is you stay on. So I put in my calendar one year to cancel the cable. So I had cable for a year, literally never used it because anything that cable had that I wanted was streaming online somewhere, or I, I just didn't care. And so to your point, yeah, like, oh man, if I want to watch every single thing and have access to every single thing out there, then yeah, I have to pay $89. But one, cable doesn't generally have everything out there anyway. Two, you pay for so much that you don't use with cable. And three, yep. if you did want to, if one, if you had the time magically to watch everything, two, you wanted to watch everything, three, and, and needed to have that capability. With the streaming services, the, the beauty 
is that you can pay for the one month and watch the show if it, assuming it's out, right? Assuming you're not paying and and even like even if you're saying you're you're watching a show live it's coming out week by week. Let's say that the show spans for like 3 months airing. Guess what? You only have to pay that, you know, $10 to Peacock for 3 months and then you can cancel it. So you're not ending yep. up paying that whole $89 uh, that you would forever, you know, you, you cancel the, the, the rest of the year for, for Peacock because you've seen what you want to see. The other thing is all of the other subscription services often have trial periods too. So even if you, you know, didn't want to sign up and pay for a show, oftentimes you can hop onto a free trial for like two weeks and watch whatever shows yep. you want and move on. It's it's marvelous. It's fantastic. And and to pretend that the, the quality of cable and streaming services is the same. It's it's really really silly. It's it's kind of like if you were to to go to a um, a clothing store and say, "Wow, look at this! I I could either buy you know a, a suit here for a, you know a full suit for three hundred dollars, includes the coat, the the shirt, and and the pants. Um, and wow, you're saying that you can save money on on clothes by going to Old Navy? Well, look." If you buy every single one of their inventory, yeah. then you you know it's it also is going to be more than three hundred dollars. And you're like, yeah, but I don't need to buy everything in that. With with the cable, you have to get everything. There's no, I mean, there there usually is some level of customization, but the baseline is way more expensive than than five dollars a month for Apple TV Plus or whatever, which is kind of the baseline in in this example. Yeah, and to, and to re, the last thing I'll say is to reinforce how wrong Ian Bremmer is on on us doing a full three sixty on this. The Bloomberg article uh, that this is from actually cites that like the average, even though like all of these services together is 89 bucks, the average American or user of streaming services only spends in the realm of 20 to $30 a month on those services. So that just means that they're getting more of what they want at a cheaper price. Um, so yeah, we, we're not, we're not, everything is getting better in this, yeah. in this area. It's not like we've gone back to, to cable. Well, and, and not to mention that I, you know, there's there's varying quality, definitely, but the fact sure. is there are high production shows being made for these streaming services, and usually the made for TV, like made for cable movies, that that sort of has a negative connotation yep. because it was low budget, it was not. But now you have shows that were with made with very high production value for these streaming services. With again varying quality, you know, maybe maybe the <laughs> Rings of Power wasn't so great on Amazon TV, but I would argue that Man in the High Castle, at least for the first couple seasons, was wonderful. So you know, you you have different shows that are being produced and created for these streaming services. Very specifically, not only are they hosting it, but they're providing new value and content by existing in this way. Yep, agree with you there. Okay, so moving to our next take. This one comes from Representative Marjorie Taylor Greene, who, of course, is no no uh, stranger to the show because she's, whether you like her or hate her, is at least interesting or as gives you something <laughs> to talk about. She tweets, Vengeance is mine, declares the Lord. God will not let evil go unpunished. The House GOP must do what is right for the American people and no longer serve the uniparty and the globalist agenda. America first. Uh, U.S. flag emoji. What do you think about this take, Brit? I mean, it kind of, I just, the rhetoric of it is kind of annoying. Um, she's not like, it's hard for me to say that it's like bad, bad, because it's like, okay, like in, in theory, that's what the House GOP <laughs> should be doing. But how convenient, right? That, oh, now we're going to get tough on all of this stuff, right? When we know that we can send the bill over to the Senate and it's going to get shot down. Or even if it, by whatever way, makes it through the Senate, gets to the desk of a Democrat president, and it's going to get not not going to be signed. And so, I just like you know, Marjorie Taylor Greene has always kind of been a little bit of she put, portrays herself as a rebel or whatever. But it's just it's a bad take because it's so convenient for her to be this way when there are actually no consequences or no not even consequences. Her positioning this way and her even acting upon it doesn't actually yield any results. Therefore, there are no consequences for her to be this way. It's it's always really cool to act like a big old, you know, uh, bully and a big old hero, maybe is a better way to put it, uh, when you've got, you know, a force field between you and the actual bully you're trying to, you know, defend your friend from or whatever. It's like, well, you know, nothing's ever going to happen. So, yeah, you can use all this rhetoric you want. And so I just like I think it's to me. MTG has had some good stuff in the past. 
Uh, but once the rubber meets the road or once she's actually has the ability to do it, like she doesn't do it. And then now that they like have the majority, it's like, oh, there's a convenient excuse, right? For, for me to use all this rhetoric uh, while also not accomplishing anything. So I guess it's politics at its finest. Yeah, I I also just cringe at the the implicit comparison that the House GOP is the vehicle for God's yeah. will. And it, which Ugh. isn't to say God doesn't use you know, various actors in history to do things. But there's this very narrow conflation of God will not not let evil go unpunished. So therefore the GOP must do uh, what's right for the, and, and I don't know if she's, you know, you could take the tweet two ways. And if I'm being more generous, maybe she's saying God won't let evil go unpunished. So the GOP needs to not do evil by serving the uniparty. Yeah. Or but if the, McCarthy, dude, like, so it's well, like, right, right. Yeah. And so, so then, you know, the less, the less, uh, I don't know, maybe the, the less nice take you could, you could see about this is her saying God will not let evil go unpunished. And the house GOP is going to needs to carry out his justice in this way, which I just think is a really gross Ugh. idea. I, you know, it, there's, there's always a, a very interesting balance because i'm not so naive as to think oh separation of church and state means that you cannot use any individual values you have from your morality to you know legislate and you know that's that's impossible right that's like saying just don't be biased well to be human is to be biased right sure. to be human is to act on your your inclinations of morality so even if you try to quote unquote separate church and state your basic foundation of the way you view the world and your epistemology is going to inform whether or not you vote for something, hopefully, uh, because it shapes what you think is right or wrong. Uh, even if that means, you know, it's framing, well, I think that, you know, my, I shouldn't enforce this biblical law because it should, it's a, it's a moral law, not a legal one that should be put on, on people, whatever you have there. But I do think that there is a, on, on, in the right, wing side of the of u.s politics there is a and it's this is no no uh you know a strong crazy deep thought you know everyone knows this but there is this uh very very fuzzy line between being christian or or having a religious value and then you know conflating it with your political agenda conflating it with your political views and and meshing the two in a way that i think is really unhealthy just as I think that many people on the left sort of view the government as their religion in many ways, I think conservative politicians, rather than view the government as their religion, they try to mesh their religion in with government. And so it becomes the same thing. And so it becomes a matter of if you are moral, if you are righteous, then you will you know, vote for me in this way because I'm I'm doing these things in the, in the name of, of you know Christianity or whatever the religion is. And I don't think that that's a... I don't think that's usually a very good way to go. Uh, and so I, I cringe a little bit when, when she, she starts out, vengeance is mine, declares the Lord, yeah. and then makes the, all, the whole tweet about the House GOP. I don't have any more on it. It's just... Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I, yeah I, guess, I guess the just in the last minute here, I think about it. If vengeance is mine, right, declares the Lord, if that's what you're, if that's what you're saying, then ultimately... <laughs> That doesn't really seem like a call to action for the GOP, right? Yeah. Vengeance is God's. Like, it's not yours to, to deal. It's not yours to do. Vengeance is his. So I, I just think that that's a misapplied verse, probably, yep. too. Oh, for Maybe sure. Our, uh, <laughs> I was going to say, our friends on the John 315 podcast, uh, if they when, get back from hiatus, get on this one here. <laughs> Take tweets out of context. I like. We can, we can have them on it. Okay. Um, <laughs> okay. Here's, uh, here's this tweet. Uh, from from someone who will remain anonymous because they are not verified, which I feel like has had, hasn't happened in a while. You know, we, we got a lot of verified yeah, people gotta here. Got to protect the uh, the unverified. But yeah, you can buy I, verification now. So <laughs> that's true. I, I was going to say I don't know if we actually need to to protect ver every verified person if it's a good takes though. But anyway, they tweet. I don't know why, but I love just randomly. I love the random two sides of content about China. China will overtake and enslave us all versus China's imminent collapse. The CCP is done for. And it's always white dudes with the most confidence you've ever heard in a video ever. LOL. So uh, what do you think about this, this take about, and you know, not even necessarily about China's position, but just this, I mean, maybe we can incorporate that too, obviously, but what do you think well, of the initial take? 
I, I actually kind of like it. I don't like the last bit, obviously, sure. where they bring the race and stuff into it because it, it just kind of reeks of uh, like, like just hating on white dudes, obviously. But um, I was just listening to a Joe Rogan podcast with a guy on, and it, there really are these two extremes, and they they are held by the same people. And you maybe even not just China, but even like Russia, right? Where it's like it's like. Russia is such a dangerous foe that they're going to roll through Ukraine. And if we lose Ukraine, you're going to lose the rest of Europe. But also Russia sucks so much they can't even take over Ukraine. And like they're so bad in Ukraine, this small little country can defy this, you know, potentially world threatening superpower. Um, Same thing with China. And it's like then you realize it's like it's the same person. It's the same people, same uniparty uh, that Marjorie Taylor Greene was talking about earlier, but is also part of. Uh, that wants you to believe both things because it's useful to their ends, right? Like they both want you to believe that this other country is such an existential threat that you need to approve their, you know, whatever type of spending or whatever type of bills they want to put through or whatever type of military action, but also be proud because we're so awesome and they suck so much. Like they're going to collapse. It's just like, yeah, you talk out of both sides of your mouth because you're trying to convince me to do what you want me to do, uh, not because you're actually dedicated to the truth. Yeah, I I loved this. I loved this take and I think it's funny because it it highlights a couple of things that I find funny. One is that what you pointed out where there's this, you know, feeding what you what you they want us to hear for whatever's convenient in the moment, whatever's convenient for the narrative. The other thing is how easy it is for people to echo and emphasize the the tiniest tidbit of information that they find from a news source and Mm -hmm. they can be completely contradictory and they're said with the exact level of confidence and 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 so you know you can you can go listening to people without verifying anything yourself and as long as people speak it with enough confidence you'll just listen to it and, and accept it and then regurgitate it and so then you end up with these completely contradictory lines of thought uh being loudly proclaimed about the very same specific issue and i just think that's that's pretty funny um and and you know the the last the last part of it the, about the the white dudes remark i you know i don't even i don't even know i i kind of don't like it because I, you know you do you sure. are kind of making it a race thing but also there is kind it of it is funny it is funny and it's kind of a, a trope right i yeah. i think there are stereotypes and i do see that existing so you know i recognize that and i think that's kind of i, I do think that's pretty funny um and and yeah, and so I I don't know it, it it wasn't like the the deepest take for me, but I did I did like it because it is it is one of those things that you constantly see, and when you stop to think and reflect on just how contrary the two thing the two narratives are, and you're like, yeah, I actually see these not only frequently but simultaneously, and it's yeah. just a very a very funny thing. It makes me think not like the the Russia Ukraine example was perfect. Um, And I think it also is, it's just always been a thing throughout the media doing this in in subtler ways. And now that I think that you have more mass media with, you know, individual people uploading content themselves, it becomes a little bit more pronounced, but I would even say, you know, in, um, in, in the foreign interventions, you know, the, the absolute level of, of gaslighting that they, the, 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 corporate media does where they say things like oh <clears throat> you know this this military uh this military group overseas needs our help and we need to send them weapons and then they turn on us and they're like this is the most dangerous threat ever we have to spend millions to to you know protect ourselves it's like just the other day you were saying that this was a small little group that needs our help so then we went we went over there and gave them weapons and now they're this insurmountable force like i get we gave them weapons but you know, I don't think that's enough to turn a a little struggling army into a world superpower necessarily. Uh, And so now it's just happening more concurrently in real time. Yeah. What's funny to me is that there, so Joe Rogan, I I'm just thinking of these two guys that I can't remember Peter something. And he's very much of the mindset that China is on imminent collapse. Uh, The CCP is done for, they don't have a sustainable government and that makes them dangerous. And so therefore we need to intervene. Like that's his viewpoint. And then maybe a week later, Joe Rogan has another guy on named Mike Baker, who's an ex-CIA agent. He's like, oh, no, no, China's like super dangerous. They're really, really like crafty. They've sent all their espionage over here, which is true in a lot of ways. Um, Because of that, we need to intervene. And it's like, oh, like how convenient, right? Like that, that regardless of which side this binary conflict is on, like there's the same solution for both of them. 
And it's like, you don't think that there's maybe some middle of the road or there's maybe a little bit of nuance in there that like doesn't result in us having to intervene. <laughs> it's like, so either way, I mean, it really shows you that like people that are telling you it's one way or it's the other way, like they're probably wrong um, or yeah. they probably have some other agenda other than the truth trying to, to, to get at you. It's just another interpretation of Woods's law. You know, no matter who you vote for, you end up with John McCain. Yeah, exactly. Uh, it doesn't matter what uh, what side of an issue you take. It always leads to the warfare state. <laughs> yep. Okay, we'll move uh, to our next take here. Uh, and this is a reply to an original tweet. So we'll start with the first tweet, which comes from Jeff Charles, Chaser of Liberty in his name. He asks, tough question. Is having kids say the Pledge of Allegiance a form of indoctrination slash programming? And uh, a, a, an individual named Latin X replies, easy. Of course it is. Is that bad? Education must, to some extent, be a form of programming, teaching kids to avoid mistakes, some of which, uh, some of which not obvious. But we must also give them the tools to look at our indoctra- indoctrination with a critical eye. When they are adults, that is. Uh, so, what do you think, Brett? Other than the split infinitive in the form in that yeah. <clears throat> third some line w- there, some of which are not obvious, but I yeah. kind of <laughs> it's this is this is a really interesting one to me. It's really hard for me to say it's one way or the other um, because I do think that it is a bad thing that the Pledge of Allegiance is set in schools. I I think it's also a weird thing. Um, to, you know, to, to force kids to do that, especially if you are someone like a Christian or hold some other religious belief that believes that there is a sovereign above and beyond uh, uh, the country that you, you live in. Uh, I definitely think it's a bad and weird thing. But on the other hand, I really I agree with the the argument that he's making that education, that children are do need to be indoctrinated in some form or fashion. Right? They're not going to you can't like they don't have the tools to understand and to think critically about things yet. Like you are teaching them that, but until they can get to that point, until they get, you you got to keep them alive, right? Or you got to, like he says in here, uh, you got to help them avoid mistakes, some of which are not obvious or they they don't have the capacity to understand yet. And so therefore the uh, the line, well, you do this because I'm telling you to, right? Like the kid wants to run into the street without holding your hand. It's like, well, why do I have to? It's like, I can't explain it to you right now. You also might not be in a place to, you know, watch a video about another kid getting squished. So you're just going to hold my hand and you're going to do it because I've told you to. That is that's indoctrination. And that's good. Right. Like that's not a bad sign of indoctrination. That's like being a responsible adult or a responsible parent. I also really like what he says. You know, we, we have to give them the tools to look at our indoctrination with a critical eye. I don't think you necessarily have to wait till they are adults to do that. I think you can be doing that throughout their whole life. So I, I give this kind of a mixed take. I I. <clears throat> I don't. I do not like the Pledge of Allegiance. I think it's a really weird thing. You know, uh, we we criticized North Korea for hanging pictures of the you know Kim Jong Il and Kim Jong Un on their school uh, walls, and then pledging or saying some sort of like uh, you know loyalty pledge to their leaders. Uh, and then we hang pictures of our presidents in the classrooms, and we turn and face the flag and put a hand over our heart and force our kids to say you know some other loyalty pledge. It's the same thing to me, just as creepy and weird. Yeah, I um. I, I agree. I think there are, are nuggets of truth and wisdom in this, but I, I think it's to me, I, I've settled. I, I went back and forth for sure, but I think I settled on mostly bad. And, and mm. here's here's my here's my rationale. I think as much as you are able, you for, for children, when it comes to how you teach them, there are things that you have to to program in, in a sense, right? And I do agree with that. However, I think that as much as you are able to, you don't teach that way as the default. That to me seems like that's fair. the way that you have to do things in specific, very important measures. But even thinking about teaching history, right? Reporting, you, you know, you're never going to have, as I said earlier, a totally unbiased view of history. You're never going to have a totally unbiased teacher. But to the best of your ability, you should be presenting the historic narrative of what happened as with as as many, you know, contextual elements and perspectives as you can offer, and then allowing students to think about different ways. So rather than indoctrinating them by saying, this is ha- this is history, this was a good thing only, you can say, look, many people in our culture and our country view this as a good thing. Here were some of the negative harms. 
do you think they outweigh that? Why or why not? Right? <laughs> In that way, you're not indoctrinating them to think a certain way. You can still come away and say, overall, you know, my, as a teacher, my perspective would be that this is a good thing, but these are other ways to consider. And that kind of thing isn't done with, you know, a, a, the reciting of a pledge or, or <laughs> yeah. you know, the reciting of even a national anthem if you had to had to do that in, in you know, any repeating fashion. Um, and so to me, yes, the things he says about how you teach children is true. I also really like the idea that you're supposed to give indoctrination a look with a critical eye. But I think that that, in this context, all of that yeah. type of thing doesn't make a lot of sense because one, I, I, also the last line, like you said, is also terrible. I don't think you just give them the critical eye when they're adults. I think you give them a critical eye as soon as they're able to grasp it. You do it incrementally, right? When they're ready and their level of maturity has shown it. So maybe for some that is adults, but I wouldn't say that by and large. But two, in this context, uh, the Pledge of Allegiance as a as a form of indoctrination is, is bad. I don't think yeah. that there is an upside to that the only, because I think that there are better ways to teach the the principles that I think you would argue you want, quote unquote, programmed or indoctrinated. At best, you, you know, the Pledge of Allegiance is supposed to teach the idea of unification with your fellow countrymen, looking out for your community and upholding ideals of liberty and and, you, you know, justice for all or whatever. One, the actual words of the Pledge of Allegiance are a little bit more like pledge to the cu country and government, which is a little creepy. But but even still, I think that there are better ways to teach those principles than to just recite the same thing yeah. over and over. And so if you're going to program a kid, you should be programming them in the way to say things like, like looking out for your community is a good thing. And and like being free individual and making your own decisions is also a good thing. And, and that kind of programming where you're affirming principles that are positive and good, and then you can take those into applying them into different situations as they get older and, and expanding on that. I don't think just re re you know repeating even if even if it was just repeating the phrase every morning, I love freedom. I love freedom. You know that would still be creepy to me. Uh, yeah. just a, a little bit less nefarious, but still creepy way. Yeah, and I, I guess the more we we talk about, it, the more I think about it. The like any sort of programming or indoctrination for a kid should only ever really be about like a priori concepts. Like I think about yeah. my my niece and nephew. You know, one of them punches the other. I'm going to say, no, you can't do that. That's wrong. I don't, there's not really a way to explain why that's wrong. That a kid, that that is helpful, it really, uh, further beyond, like, that's just a wrong thing to do, right? Like, to hurt another person uh, when you're jealous that they took your toy or whatever is a wrong thing. And like, that's that's actually good, like, not indoct, it's not even indoctrination. It's just teaching a principle that should be the foundation of your life. Once you get anywhere beyond that, like every single thing that you teach a kid should relate back to those principles. And therefore, like those are the reasons. Then it's not indoctrination. It's looking at a critical, looking with a critical eye at principles that you've had your whole life. And so what this guy is saying, like if you kind of like really dig down into the root of it, he's saying that the Pledge of Allegiance is a principle, a foundational principle that kids should be taught from a young age. And I really don't agree with that. And so I, I, I think I've, uh, you've persuaded me. It is uh, yeah. overall very bad take uh sinisterly bad in a lot of ways like this nationalism and uh 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 what is it called um not community uh identitarianism i i don't know like these things are foundational that we should instill them in kids um to you know like that part of their their moral foundation and principle is how it relates to the country or piece of dirt that they were born in um or what the people in power at be uh, should tell them to do and i i do think that's very bad yeah, I, I, you know, best case scenario, he's he's viewing the issue, you know, sort of as as when you first approached it, right? This this sort of overview, high level, not not thinking directly in the context of the Pledge of Allegiance. He's more thinking, well, yeah, it is, but then how do we teach in general? And then he's speaking more on the concept of teaching. And again, I I would agree with you rather than going this way. So I I don't I don't agree with it. But hopefully hopefully this is less of a commanding take than than you and I I think would read that. He's got, I looked at his Twitter. I mean, even though his. <clears throat> Shoot. You got me. I got you now. <laughs> Somehow my, uh, my USB or something like that. Um, 
Kim unplugged. So I'm going to, oh. hold on. I'm just going to do this and we'll present again. Cool. And then I'll just splice it with the audio and it should be fine. Yeah. And I can, I'll make the, the video match up or whatever. You were just saying that you, uh, you were yeah. looking at his Twitter. So I, we did hear that beat can start. Yeah. Sorry, sorry, friends. Uh, just dropped off. Um, but I'm back on now. What I was going to say is that I looked at his Twitter, even though he's a Latinx, uh, that's his Twitter name. And that's kind of a, you know, a lefty thing. He's actually pretty right wing and he's based on a lot of things. I saw some pretty good gun, gun memes. So yeah, it's not so bad, but on this, I didn't like it very much. I was going to say, it's probably a play on, on Malcolm X is my, is my guess as a joke, but um, yeah, I, I, yeah. I was going to say, I, I, yeah, overall, I, I do wonder about, you know, how, how you draw that line. And I'm not even saying it's easy, right? I don't, I'm not pretending to know, this is just how you, how you teach a kid correctly and they're going to turn out great. Parenting is difficult. It's hard. And every kid is different. And I, th and I, that is the other thing to me, right? Because every kid is different, there there are some principles I think in parenting that are important that I hope to implement myself and I know is difficult to be consistent with, but also every kid does need things differently in, in explanation, in rationalization. Some kids really do need a hard line. They're going to rebel and you kind of have to just set things in stone without the, the nuance or explanation, right? Saying this is the way that things are going to be because you're not capable right now of handling it another way. And Again, I don't think a pledge of allegiance is the best way to communicate what it wants to, but that type of, you know, methodology, the idea that you have to lay something down and rep with teaching over repetition uh, without a lot of nuance, there, there are some kids who genuinely need that and that's fine. But also a public school makes every single student do this every day. Yep. And that is teaching every ch child to in the in the same way, whether or not they need it just a general problem with, I think, public school anyway. Okay, and we'll move on to our last take. And this one comes from former uh, guest on the show, Brad Palumbo. Uh, Brad tweets, with a few exceptions for people with rare medical conditions, it's not hard to be obese. In not fact, hard to not be. I'm sorry, it's not hard to not be obese. I was reading this, I'm like, wait, I thought this was reverse. Yeah, yeah, it's not hard to not be obese. In fact, it's hard to be and stay obese. Parentheses, not talking about a little pudgy here. You have to actively make multiple very unhealthy choices every day. What do you think about that one? Yeah, I think it's good. Um, uh, I think he's right. Um, I mean, obviously, there's some qualitative stuff with like hard and all this. Stuff. Like what one person considers easy or hard is, is different. But in general, like he's very right that you have to actively choose to uh, make some really, really bad choices uh, on multiple different dimensions, you know, not just on what you eat, but also the activity that you choose to do every day, uh, the types of food that you choose to eat, uh, not just the quantity um, to become obese. And I don't know what the BMI is for that. And I, I can't, I don't even know percentages for the population or anything like that. But, um, you know, you have to really like, really, really choose it. Um, and like he was saying, like, I think that there are mental disorders and there are health conditions that, that can make it difficult. Um, but that doesn't, that doesn't change the fact that for majority of humans, you know, in all of, uh, history have not been obese, right? Like that's a relatively new phenomenon. Uh, and there's, it's, it's really something to say that, you know, the poorest among us in the United States, at least are, are people that are, are very, very overweight. Um, you know, I, I think that, I don't know. Have you seen those pictures online of like comparing like Brazil in the 1970s to like now? And like, mm -mm, no. it's really interesting, man. I mean, I think there's a lot of stuff like between like potentially seed oils or just what they, you know, the food pyramid and, and all these different things that have contributed to it. Right. Like actual true misinformation um, about like, hey, your most of your diet should be should be grains and sugar and stuff like that. And then uh, things like vegetables and meat should be limited. I think, you know, the health uh, system got that wrong. And with them getting that wrong, it has also like contributed to that. But uh, to be obese is is like a really um, uh, it, it, it's it, it's extraordinary, I, I guess I would say. Um, and it's it's a really sad thing that there are a lot of people that are in that that category. Yeah, I I I think that you're you're right, especially early when you you said it's hard to judge some things qualitatively. I think this is a good take. 
but you do have to worry or not worry, but wonder about individual qualifications such as, is it not necessarily hard or is it, is it, you know, not exceptionally difficult so long as you have an upbringing of, you know, moderate self-discipline and things like that. Because I think there are a lot of things that I take for granted, which is, I'm not even the most healthy individual, but I know at a certain point not to engage in some things that are going to just totally put me over the, you know, over the fence in terms of being unhealthy. You know, I, I recognize I should probably balance my diet a little bit, even if I'm not eating super healthy. I recognize I should work out at least some with some frequency, even if it's not as much as others. But all of that comes with an upbringing where I was blessed to have parents who cared about, you know, teaching things like self-discipline and control over yourself. And I think that those are traits mm. that every individual should exercise and should do because the more you know, you know, the more you exercise your your discipline, the, the easier it is to live in in a way that is denying yourself currently in order that you can make a better future. And the problem is the the more our culture goes into a state of instant gratification, the the less you have a a focus on denying yourself now and self discipline. And so, I think that he's right. I think that you know, being obese is pretty difficult to get to that point. It's pretty difficult to get that point. But I also think that it can be very easy if your upbringing doesn't give you the tools to, that you have in place sure. to, to know how to have discipline. Or of course, I, and, and maybe he would count this under sort of a rare medical condition, but I would also say there are, are psychological things that can drive people into obesity, like upbringing uh, issues, um, especially if there was abuse or if they like didn't have food growing up because of a parent who, who, you know, didn't let them eat or things like that. So there's a lot of complicated issues with that. But, but again, generally, I think that the average person um, who, who gets to that state needs to recognize that there is something going on. Whereas I think a lot of people who are obese try to blame like the system or capitalism or whatever it is, where I think that, you know, the, the psycho psychological issues I bring up are actually sort of an endorsement of, of what Brian's yeah. saying here, because it's, I would say the average isn't just a matter of, even, even though I would say instant gratification is being overrun in our culture, I wouldn't say that's the primary factor driving people to obesity. I would say it's a primary factor in driving people to maybe be a little bit more pudgy or a little bit more unhealthy sure. than, than they should be and, and, were, and were. But to actually get to obesity, it's not just a matter of, oh, I didn't have that much discipline and I, you know, I had, you know, too much chocolate for a few months and now I'm obese. It's like you have to get there through very deliberate choices and, and you know, that can be a coping mechanism for something that's traumatic or much worse. But but at that point, you need, you need to recognize that you are the issue in some level, again, except for a, a, a medical condition completely out of your, your, of your control. And even if it's not your fault, you are responsible to take charge of that uh, and address the underlying issue, whether that's psychological or medical or, or whatever, what, what have you. Yeah. I had, a um, our, my band had a manager for a bit. He's now like, a um, uh, he does like male fitness competitions mm -hmm. and everything. Mm -hmm. And I remember him telling me, he's like, look, like he, he designed some like food plans for us and everything for free, which was awesome. And, um, he told me, he's like, look, like you didn't like people that are overweight, didn't get to be overweight by just one day of, 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 of overeating. Right. And you don't become skinny by having one day of not eating enough or whatever, you know, it is, or making good decisions. It's a consistent day to day habit that gets you one way or the other. Right. And so you kind of free, like for us, he was trying to free us up that like, Hey, if you're on the road and you have to go stop at a gas station to eat some unhealthy food, it's like, that's not going to screw you over. Right. In the same way that you, you know, if you have one day where you eat whatever good stuff you're going to do and you go run 10 miles and you work out like you're not going to be skinny and and fit the next day um it's 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 consistency right so whatever you can do consistently is is what um is what's going to yield results and so I, I think brad's totally right here it's like yeah it's you have to eat a lot of calories and almost enough to be like it's work uh to to have such a um to have such a surplus of calories and not uh, be working out to reach something like three or 400 pounds uh, when your frame doesn't support that. Like that's, that's actively work. Like I think about Michael Phelps, you know, when he was training for, 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 to be an Olympic swimmer, he had to eat like 12,000 calories a day. 
right? Like he was like, it was so hard to eat that much calories, right? And for you to become like a 300, 400 pound person, not necessarily doing what Michael Phelps is doing, but you'd have to eat around that ballpark every day without his activity. And that's like, you know, if it's hard for Michael Phelps with his activity, uh, it would be very, very hard to to do that without uh, the activity, I'd say. Yeah, absolutely. And and recognizing that getting to that point, it it does like you, you know, like the advice was saying, it, it's, a, it's not just a one day thing. And but the more you succumb to that, the easier it's going to get to get to that point. Yep. Um, it kind of it kind of just makes me think of even the the idea of. I think C.S. Lewis writes about it in the context of sin, but the the ever decreasing pleasure or an ever increasing desire for an ever diminishing pleasure. Mm. And I think that that's a lot of where you get with obesity too, is where you're chasing something else and you end up trying to seek out more and more and more and finding satiation for some other need that's not being satiated in that. And so you drive yourself there. And that's actually a difficult place to get to for, for the average person who's not suffering from something else. Yeah. I, it would, it would take me a, a long time to get to that point. Um, and I, I don't want to get there. <laughs> so me you, you kind of have to make an effort, unfortunately, but with that, I think we'll call it. And so, uh, yeah, I think we're good. So thanks so much guys for listening to this episode as a reminder, if you want to like and comment, uh, share all that good stuff really helps us out. Subscribe, leave a review, everything <laughs> that's good and nice. We appreciate it. And we'll catch you on the next one. See ya.